So for number one, finding this volume, we have to find the area of the base. Now, of course, this is our base because there's another one just like it up here. So we're going to find the area of that base, which is a rectangle and a circle, two half circles, which make one full circle. So our rectangle, what's its dimensions? Well, if this is 18, right, that would make this 4 and 4, right? So if that's 4, that would be 8. It would be a 4-inch radius gives you an 8-inch diameter. So that's 80 square inches. Now I'm going to pause there. Does everybody see where that 8 inches comes from? Okay, yeah. So you got the 18 here, so that has to be 4 and 4 on each side of the 10 to make it 18. So that means it's a 4-inch radius, so 10-inch or 8-inch diameter. For piece two, then, it's the two half circles, which makes one full circle. How do I find the area of a circle? Pi times radius squared. Yeah. So pi times the radius here is 4, which gives us 50.24. So that adds up to make 130.24 square inches. That's the area of our base. So now to find the volume, we take the area of the base times the height, the 30. That term height, of course, is a little deceiving because it doesn't always go up and down. It's just the distance between the bases. Yeah, times 30, what does that give us? Perfect. I'm having a good internal calculator day. That's always good. I've had days where everything I threw out there for a calculation was off. So 3,907.2 cubic inches. Now, this isn't something I asked you to do, but let's do it anyway. Let's convert it to gallons. Does anybody remember how many gallons are in, or how many cubic inches are in a gallon? Two hundred thirty-one, approximately. So here, because of the way this is set up, are you going to multiply by the two thirty-one or divide? Divide. So what's that give us? Sixteen point nine one. So just under seventeen gallons. Now this other one over here looks like a monster, but it really isn't that bad. As long as we just kind of methodically divide it up. I'm gonna cut it here, here, and here. So we have four pieces in the base. Of course, that's our base, because this shape here is also this shape up here. So to find that area, I've got the first piece. Piece one is a triangle. How do I find its area? Perfect, so that's 72, and those are in centimeters, so that's square centimeters. Piece two, right here, is a rectangle. How do I find its area? 16 times eight, which is 128 centimeters squared. Piece three, right here, how do I find that area? Eight times 10, which is 80 centimeters squared, and piece three, this last one, or piece four, I should say. You got eight times six divided by two, which is 24. What is that, 304? So 304 centimeters squared is the area of our base. So to find a volume, what do we do? 
times the 40. You got it. That's our distance between bases. Giving us 12,160, and that'll be centimeters cubed now for volume. Well, just for fun, let's convert that into liters. Now remember, the conversion that we have to make first is from centimeters cubed to milliliters because a centimeter cubed and a milliliter are the same thing. So that's 12,160 milliliters. And then to convert that to liters, from milliliters to liters is three spots, right? So it's 12.16 liters. Make sense? So last class, we talked about the difference between volume and capacity. Volume, that was not the tool I was looking for there. Volume are these things that we calculated from the length measurements. Volume always comes from multiplying three length measurements or an area of a base times another length. These are capacity. Those are standard size containers. In the metric system, they planned them so that there was an easy conversion from volumes to capacities. Standard system, of course, they never intended on using them together until uh, literally like 12, 1,500 years ago. They started forcing them, adjusting things so they did fit together. Well, today we're going to discuss something similar, the difference between weight and mass. We haven't discussed this yet, right? Didn't think so. Weight is the measurement of the force of gravity on an object. Whereas mass is the amount of matter. in an object. <clears throat> What's the difference? Well, the key word for weight is force. Force is measured with a spring. Um, if you have a good spring, Let's say we start out with a spring that's just sitting there at its natural length without being stre stretched at all. If we then take that spring and we stretch it out a distance, we'll just call that D, the distance from where its rest position was, there's amount of force that it takes, we'll just call that F, to stretch it that far. If I take that same spring and I stretch it further to the point where it's now stretched twice as far, so we'll call that 2D from the rest position, the amount of force it would take to stretch it that far is 2F. The length that a spring stretches from its rest position is directly proportional to the amount of force that it takes to do it. So if you know the spring and you've calibrated the spring, you can very, very precisely calculate the force by how far the spring is stretched. So weight is measured using a scale. And what a scale is is simply a spring that has a long arm below it, and it's encased into something that has a scale. So we'll have an indicator on it of some sort. And then markings on here that are scaled to how much force it takes to stretch the spring that distance. So if we hang our object on there that we're trying to measure, it's going to stretch 
and we can use that scale to figure out how far it's stretched and how much force that is. So we're measuring the force of gravity. Mass is measured with something called a balance. A balance is really like a very precision teeter-totter, basically, seesaw. We put what we're trying to measure on one side, and on the other side we put known masses until it balances. And when it balances, whatever this known mass is, that's the mass of our object. Well, you might really be thinking, well, that's pretty much the same thing. And it is. The more mass an object has, the more its weight is going to be. They're, they're very directly related. The big difference is mass does not depend on gravity. So let's say we go to the moon. On the moon, gravity is one-seventh or one-sixth of what it is on Earth. So the weight is going to be one-sixth because it's only going to stretch a sixth as far because there's less gravity pulling on it, less force. The balance, however, yeah, the amount of gravity on this object changes, but the amount of gravity pulling on our known mass changes as well. So the same amount still balances it. If you think about it, there's no fewer particles inside that object. There's the same amount of matter inside that object. So that's the big difference. Now in the standard scale, standard measurement system, we tend to focus on weight. There is a standard unit of mass that I'm guessing you've probably never heard of before called slug. You ever heard the old expression, there's a whole slug of them over there? No? Well, that's where it came from, is a slug is actually 32 pounds. It's a relatively large unit. Outside of engineering and physics, I've never seen anybody use a slug in a practical application. So it doesn't get used a whole lot. In the standard system, we tend to focus on weight. And we tend to equate mass and weight, which is okay. On Earth, gravity is pretty constant, so the relationship between mass and weight is pretty direct. Um, gravity is actually a little bit stronger at the North and South Pole and weaker at the equator. Now when I say that, I'm saying like three or four percent. A 200 pound person would be seven or eight pounds lighter at the equator than they would be at the North Pole. Slightly, yeah, a little bit. And mostly it's just because of the elongation of the Earth. It is a ball, but because it's spinning, it's, you know, if you ever take a rubber ball and you spin it really fast, you can actually see it stretch out. That's kind of what the Earth has done, is it stretched out at the equator, so you're further away from the core of the Earth. And because of the spinning of the Earth, that uh, inertia is trying to kind of pull you away. I mean, it doesn't spin fast enough to throw somebody off the surface of the Earth, but it does have a slight influence on gravity. So, Weight, your weight does vary slightly as you move around the Earth from one area to another, but not enough that we can worry about it. So we tend to get sloppy and slip back and forth between weight and mass, even though the units we use really are weight units. So what is the largest unit of weight that we typically use? The ton. How big is a ton? 2,000 pounds. And that's what we always think of when we hear the word ton. That is actually what is called one net or short ton. Now in this class, when I use the word ton, I always mean 2,000 pounds. 99.99% .99 of the time in the real world, you hear the word ton, they're talking about 2,000 pounds. 
But the fact that there is a net or short ton implies that there is a gross or long ton. A gross ton is 2,240 pounds. Why is there a difference? Let's just say your paycheck. If you work 40 hours in a week and you get paid $12 an hour, you earn $480 for the week. You, that's the gross amount that you've earned. You get paid that amount? No, they take out taxes, costs for benefits, and whatever. You might get $300 out of that $480. That's your net amount. Same thing here. The ton was originally used for buying and selling grain. You couldn't throw a ton of grain on a scale because it would fall off. You had to have it in a container. So the gross ton is the grain and the container. The, the net ton is just the grain. The container that held a, a ton of grain is about 240 pounds. Like I said, you almost never see this in use today. We will not use it in this class. Um, any quiz or test, if you see ton, I'm talking 2,000 pounds. Now, there's also a unit out there called a gross. You say you want to order a gross of them? A gross is a dozen dozen in most cases. Some different products will have a different application. Some products have a different defined gross amount. But you know, just be aware that those words are slightly different. So we have the pound. Now the pound is abbreviated LB. It would make sense for the pound to be abbreviated PB, but in the bookkeeping system that was being used for, for buying and selling grain, PB was already used as the abbreviation for paid. It would be really bad to mix up pounds and paid. So what they did for an abbreviation for pounds was use the Latin word, which is Libra. So LB comes from that Latin Libra for pounds. What's smaller than a pound? An ounce. How many ounces in a pound? 16 ounces in a pound. Now they do the same thing with ounces. They use the Latin word for pound for the abbreviation, Libra. They use the Latin word for ounce, which is ounza. So ounce is abbreviated OZ. The only reason they did that was because they used the Latin word for pound. They wanted to use it for the ounce as well. A lot of people have never heard of this unit, but smaller than an ounce, we have a dram. There are 16 drams in an ounce. A lot of people think of a dram as being metric. It is not. It is the, the standard unit. Um, there's minims. There are 60 minims, and I believe it's in a dram. Um, grains. There are 7,000 grains in a pound. Grains always go back to a pound. Um, grains and drams, actually, drams are an apothecary unit as well. You might be prescribed an eighth of a dram of a medication or a quarter of a dram. Grains, um, a lot of your medications, you know, like 100 grains or whatever. If you're into shooting, your bullets and your gunpowder. You have 120 grains, 100 grains, 80 grains, whatever. Now, you might hear on the news, gold has reached you know, $2,000 an ounce or whatever. They're not using the same ounces and pounds as what we're used to. Um, precious metals use a different measuring system. Remember when we were talking about feet and inches? We said you know, King Edward declared his foot and his thumb and everything are going to be the official units. And we mentioned that other rulers in different regions did the same thing. That's why the metric meter is not the same as our yard. The meter is actually the Swiss yard. Their yard is a little bit longer than ours. The same thing happened with pounds and ounces and all of that. For centuries, the world center for trading precious metals was the island of Troy in the Mediterranean Sea, just off the coast of Greece. So for precious metals, we use Troy measurements. And in the Troy measuring system, one Troy pound 
is approximately 0.82 US pounds. So a troy pound is smaller than a US pound. However, one troy pound only contains 12 troy ounces. So a troy ounce is actually a little bit bigger than our standard ounce. So what we think of as an ounce is the troy ounce is a little bit bigger than that. So when they're talking about gold, $2,000 an ounce is a little bit more than what we think of as an ounce. Again, we won't be tested on that. I just wanted to throw that out there because it's something you do here on the news. In the metric system, they tend to focus on mass. There is a metric unit of weight. I'll do weight slash force because it's also a unit of force. That is called the Newton. Now, because the Newton kind of depends on gravity, there wasn't a nice neat conversion to Newtons. We had to use the gravitational constants. Um, I suppose that was the one mistake they made in the metric system is really what they should have done was they should have started with natural constants. They should have started with gravity, found a nice neat unit for gravity, and then worked their way up from there. Um, but they did. And so the, the weight unit, the force unit, was the one that didn't work out. Um, one kilogram, if under normal Earth gravity, is 9.8 newtons. You may have, if you took a physical science class, you may have had 9.8 is the acceleration of gravity. That's where that comes from. Again, outside of engineering and physics, I have never seen a Newton used in practical application. Uh, maybe a little bit in meteorology, you hear uh, Newtons per cubic meter as far as, or per square meter as far as atmospheric pressure and stuff like that. But usually they use Pascals or other units like that. So metric focuses on mass. The unit of mass in the metric system is a gram. Now we've mentioned that our units in the metric system are all tied together. A gram is equal to the mass of one milliliter of water. So we have a gram, a little bit heavier than a paper clip is basically what a gram comes in. Relatively small unit. Works out nice for medications though because um, it's small enough that when we divide it up, we get some nice small units for, for our dosages. Just like everything else, um, gram of course is abbreviated with just a G. We have decigram, which is a tenth of a gram, centigram, which is a hundredth of a gram, Milligram, which is a thousandth of a gram. Um, just like with our other units, we tend not to use deci and centi. We tend to use the, the, the milli the most. Going larger, uh, we have decagram, D-A-G, which is 10 grams. Hectogram, H-G, which is 100 grams. And kilogram, which is 1,000 grams. Again, these tend to not get used, we use the kilogram. Bigger yet, you know, from a thousand, we skip the 10,000 and 100,000, we go straight to a million, which was mega, with a capital M rather than a little m, a megagram is a million grams. One megagram is actually a thousand kilograms which is defined to be one metric ton. Well, if you listen to the farm report, they talk about buying and selling grain internationally. You know, corn is up to 200 and some dollars per ton. They're talking metric tons. When it comes to international trade, that's done in metric tons. Now, one kilogram is a thousand grams.
If I go 10 by 10 by 10, that's a thousand, right? 10 milliliters would be a centiliter. So it is one, well, it's one liter, is what it comes out to be. It's a thousand grams of a thousand milliliters. Kilogram is the mass of one liter of water. We won't get into the whole centimeters and stuff like that. Um, our conversion between standard and metric. Kilogram is actually bigger than a pound. One kilogram is about 2.2. Technically, it's like 2.208, but we usually round it to just 2.2 pounds. So somebody who is 240 pounds, if I want to convert that into kilograms, I'll put pounds on bottom, kilograms on top. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Am I multiplying or dividing here? Dividing. What's 240 divided by 2.2? One hundred nine point zero nine kilograms. Sounds much nicer than two hundred forty pounds, right? Um, one metric ton. Is a thousand kilograms. Let's convert that into pounds. So we'll put the kilogram on bottom. One kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. So of course here we're going to be multiplying 1,000 times 2.2, 2,200 .2, pounds in a metric ton. So a metric ton is exactly 10% larger, or almost exactly. And like I said, it's technically 2,208 pounds. It's about 10% larger than a standard ton. Something else I wanted to go over while we're here. Let's say we have two hundred yards by two hundred eighty yards. Assuming that this is a rectangle, <coughs> what's the area of that? 56,000, what would be our units? Square yards. How many acres would that be? Well, we don't have a conversion from square yards into acres, do we? We know that one acre is 43,560 square feet. So if we convert that square yards into square feet, we could go from there. A square yard is how many square feet? Careful. It's three feet in a yard, right? So a square yard is three by three, which would be, no. You're thinking cubic. Three by three by three would be 27. So just three by three is nine. There we go. So 56,000 times nine. So 504,000 cubic feet. So five, or square feet, I should say. 504,000 square feet over one. 43,560 square feet in an acre. So that's, of course, going to be dividing the 504,000 divided by 43,560. What's that give us? 11.56 acres. Which is still a pretty nice plot of land. In the metric system, there is a comparable unit 
we almost never hear about it because it never gets used in the United States. I mean, it will at some point. It's called an R. What was that, Logan? An R. is 10 meters by 10 meters. 4R, 1R equals 100 meters squared. It's almost never used as an R. This is the one, in fact, when they did the R as the main unit, they did not do deci-Rs. And they did not do milli R's. All they did, only the ones they did are centi R's and hectares. So they did not do deca or kilo as well. A hectare, hectare, hectare is how many? 100. So a hectare is 100 R's or 100 times 100 is 10,000. You got it. Meters squared. So a standard city lot what is it? About 22 meters by 22 meters. How many R's is that? Well, what's the area? Four eighty four meters squared. So let's convert that into into R's. One R is a hundred meters squared. That's four point eight four R's. It's a really awkward unit that, like I said, I've never seen it used in the United States. Um, it's there, but it is used even in Europe. It hasn't caught on like the rest of the metric system. Um, what's that? No, I just gotta give you homework. Well, speaking of tests, though, um, we are nearing the end of WITC semester. Yep. So probably uh, not this Friday, but next Friday I will leave the unit test here for you, so that you have that to work on. Um, That'll give you a week to do it that last Friday, which will be December 18th. I'll have you turn that in for you, hopefully with a bunch of other stuff too by then. Okay. Um, yep. And hopefully you've still got a couple other things at home yet. Um, if you don't have them, let me know. We'll take a look. So I'll give you a week to get that done and turned in so I can grade those over my Christmas break and have you all set to go. Um, I think I come I come back for this group like January. Let me check check the calendar here. I think my first day back is the eight is the eighth for you guys. In the spring, we only have class on Friday. It'll be from one until three thirty on Fridays. To three thirty, it'll be two and a half hours every Friday. Yeah, I know. But what we'll do is, since Logan had asked for a longer break, what we'll do is we'll probably go from like 1 until 2.10, and then take a 15 or 20 minute break, and then go from there until our 3.30. That way you get a long enough break to be productive. We could do that, take no break, and be done at like 3.10. Two hours and ten minutes is a long time to go straight through for math. <laughs> oh, 
especially when we go till three o'clock in the afternoon, the two thirty people's eyes start to droop anyway. Oh, yeah. I can't see you. I can't see you. I was not doing that. I was going to ask. When? Okay, so those are the pages. <laughs> I have a book that have to do a break in the Page 276, exercise 9-14. They're both on page 276. Yeah. Actually, this one might be 275. It's from the old edition of the textbook, which I've got on my lesson plan, but it's crossed off with the page for the new edition in, so...